What's up, everybody? Matt Kajeski here, back again with the Odd Shopper channel. Today, we're talking the Elite Eight, the second half of the Sunday games. Before we get started, make sure to hit that thumbs up button, subscribe to the channel, and hit the notification bell so you know when this and all other content goes live. We are brought to you by Bet365 with a limited time offer for those of you in Kentucky, Ohio, New Jersey, Virginia, Iowa, Colorado, Louisiana, Indiana, Arizona, and North Carolina. What you'll do is click the link in the video description below. Make your first deposit of at least $10. Turn that around, $5 wager on any team, total market, whatever you want. Whether it wins or loses, you are getting $150 in the form of bonus bets. You must be 21 or older to play, 18 in Kentucky. If you or somebody knows a gambling problem, please call or text 1-800-GAMBLER. This is $150 you didn't have in your bankroll just for signing up, and the wager is basically risk-free because of the bonus bets you're getting in return. So take advantage of this. It's only a limited time offer. I can assure you that. All right. So we have the Elite Eight settled. This is being recorded before the first half of the Elite Games, so don't have those results yet. But we do have the Sweet 16, and we'll talk about what happened in each of those games as we get into those teams. We'll kick things off. Let's see here. There we go. I believe this is actually our second game, but I want to talk about this one first. It's NC State and Duke. I've been betting against NC State kind of every step of the way here and taking some L's. Recently, they beat Marquette outright. That was about the most egregious game I've ever seen that Marquette team play. They should have won the game. Covering's a different story, but shot historically low three-point percentage, historically. And if they shoot even 26% from three, they win that game. And it's not like NC State was doing their job contesting a lot of those threes. That's all on Marquette. So last thing I'll say on the talent of NC State, I don't think they're a very good team. I don't think they played very well in that game. Marquette just found a way to play worse. Now, they enter this matchup on a pretty amazing winning streak. They've somehow turned this into eight games. And it's basically all through the conference tournament because they lost five of their last six heading into the ACC tournament. Then they rattled off five straight wins, barely beat Louisville, kind of killed Syracuse, beat our very own Duke team more on that later. Beat Virginia in overtime where that really came down to a missed free throw. If you have that free throw made, we're not talking about NC State anymore. Then they beat North Carolina in the championship. Good win there. Beat Texas Tech in the opening round, who had a big injury in their front court to Warren Washington. Beat Oakland, who should not have been in the tournament. That was an overtime game. And then they just beat Marquette that shot a historically low three-point percentage. It's a lot of really crazy outcomes back to back to back to back to back. Eight of those back-to-backs. And sometimes that happens and you get these runs in the fun Cinderella stories. And players like DJ Burns who get a lot of press because they look a little different. But NC State matches up against Duke. And we saw these teams play a pair of times already this year. The first one. Duke absolutely ravaged NC State. That was on NC State's home floor. It was a 79-64 blowout in favor of Duke. And there wasn't really too much to see in that game. Duke played pretty well, and NC State actually shot 33% from three and 51% from the floor. They didn't play that bad. That's about what NC State does. And Duke only shot 30% from three, but they got killed by the guards. That wasn't even a good game for Filipkowski. He only finished with nine points and three fouls. And that's just the thing with Duke. They have multiple ways to beat you. The second time they faced off, this was kind of a historically low performance from Duke. They shot 25% from three, which is way below their season average. We'll talk about that in a second. And you had to get NC State shooting 44% from three in order to win that game. DJ Burns did not do a good job in the front court. He only had 10 points. And that was kind of the story of this NC State team, winning through an outlier shooting performance from three, which has kind of been the case for them multiple times since they've went on this run. As far as how they match up here, as you can see on the screen, and as we've talked about really ad nauseum throughout this tournament, Duke has the advantage every single place in this game. Offense, defense, height in the front court, that's a huge one. Marquette wasn't really able to exploit that, but you are going to see this be another mismatch. Duke is 10th in height, NC State's 105th. You have a versatile big man in Filipkowski, DJ Burns, He's good at blocking shots, and he's actually kind of a good facilitator on offense, but he's limited. He's not a guy you want playing in space, and that's what Filipkowski and Duke's going to try to do. NC State is 220th at defending the three. Duke is 11th shooting that. We've talked about their shooters. Proctor, Roach, McCain, you have three guys there that shoot at least 37% from three and two above 40%. 
On NC State, you're decent at shooting the three, 139th, but that basically just comes down to DJ Horn, and then you have a couple guys in the mid-30s percentage-wise in terms of what you're getting from three, and then they don't play well inside. DR has given them better minutes than what they were getting earlier this year, but DJ Burns, still a limited player offensively, and you don't get much out of Middlebrooks in this area of the floor either. The effective shooting gap is 159th to 18th, so Duke should really have their way scoring in this game. I think you can lay sixes. Those are opening in the market. NC State has taken some money. Nothing I'd play now and nothing I have played because I think you honestly might get a five and a half before Sunday. But honestly, what I'm looking at even more than a side in this game is the total. It's at 143. Both teams are pretty good on offense. And we mentioned some of the shooting limitations for NC State. They're not a terrible shooting team by any means. They're slightly above average in most of these metrics. We talked about some of the individual players. You basically live and die with Horn at the 341 there. Jaden Taylor's at 36%. Michael O'Connell's at 37 Sometimes those guys are a little streaky. Just not quite where you'd want their three-point percentage, but they're not bad by any means. So this team can shoot. And then Filipkowski has had some defensive liabilities in the past. It didn't really show up in either of their previous games, but it's something that we've seen before. So it's at least worth mentioning there. I don't think you see another elite DJ Burns performance. I will say he did have a very good game the first time these teams matched up. But again, Filipkowski wasn't on the floor for most of that game. He only played 22 minutes. DJ Burns ended up with 31 and scoring 27 points. The next time they played DJ Burns only 10 points, and Filipkowski ends up playing 34 in that game. So you can see a big difference in the mismatches there. Filipkowski also scored 28 himself. So in a lot of ways, it comes down to that. I think defensively with Filipkowski inside, if he's off the floor, just don't trust the back of bigs like TJ Power, Ryan Young, and Sean Stewart. But ultimately, I think we do have some ability for this NC State team to score, and I don't really see a lot of ways where NC State stops Duke themselves. You look at what Duke has just allowed recently. Their defense looks pretty good, but you played a Houston team that lost Jamal Shedd right away. That's a slow team. Only allowed 55 to James Madison. It's a fancy mid-major program. Only allowed 47 to Vermont. That is a mid-major program. Then before, 69 to NC State. 79 to – or 84 to North Carolina. 74 to NC State, excuse me. And basically, the only teams you're really holding down if you're Duke's defense are – Virginia who plays slow or teams like Louisville who are just very bad. So I think this one gets up and down a little bit. The over 49 and a half is where I will look. Next up, we've got our second game, the much better game on paper. It's Tennessee taking on Purdue. Really fun game. Maybe the best game left in the Elite Eight. And this game is a tight spread. It's Purdue minus three. Tennessee just got past Creighton to get to this spot. And you saw Purdue get a little bit of a scare in the first half against Gonzaga, but ultimately both of them get it done. It's a slight spread, three points here. Tennessee, to get to this spot, they were a one and done in the SEC tournament, dropped a game to Mississippi State. Then they rattle off a win over St. Peter's, barely get by Texas, and then kind of surpass Creighton at the very end. That was a game of runs. Tennessee went on a major run, huge win, and then... Creighton kind of came back, but didn't wasn't able to do quite enough in that game. Conversely, Purdue, they played a couple cupcakes, Grambling State. Utah State got in foul trouble immediately and then just couldn't play in that game once they had some of their limitations exposed via depth. And then they end up beating Gonzaga by 22, a game that was much closer in the first half. As far as these teams matching up, Purdue's the more balanced team overall. Offense and defense, they're top 15. Tennessee is outside the top 30 in offensive efficiency. to 35th, often living and dying by connect. Both teams very good at rebounding. Tennessee, that comes more through effort. Purdue just has the bodies and the effort. They're first in effective height, second in rebounding. Tennessee is going to be in a massive disadvantage in the front court. They're 142nd in height, 41st in rebounding. And luckily, we do have a sample of these two teams playing this year. They met in non-conference. Purdue got a win 71-67, to and it was a weird game. I think a lot of things we saw in that game are very alive to happen again. Zach Eady was a huge mismatch. He scored 23 points. The guy shot 17 free throws, and somehow he only had 10 rebounds, but it barely squeaked by a double-double for him, but he still got there. So how did Tennessee try to defend it? Well, their big man, Adu, fouled out in 13 minutes. I'm not kidding. Fouled out. Five fouls in 13 minutes. And their front court had a ton of problems from there because you just had to rely on so much depth. 
The best performance in the game came from Connect, but ultimately, I think it was so close because you had an outlier performance from from Purdue from the three-point line, and honestly, from two. You look at what Purdue did, 27% from three, 38% from two. I mean, these are way below the season averages for Purdue, and we've seen this in a couple games. To beat Purdue, you need them to play poorly, and then you need to be on your A game. So Tennessee, they only shot 27% from three themselves. They kept it close because Purdue shot so poorly. That's not enough. You need to have an outlier performance yourself and have Purdue off their A game in some way, whether it's getting Edie in foul trouble or they're missing threes. So that's the two keys to this game. Can you get Tennessee to play beyond what they normally do? And I'm not sure. This team is 144th in effective field goal percentage, Purdue's 13th. So they're not a good shooting team, and you're going to need to have them play better than what we've seen this year. You look at the individual players for this Tennessee team, you have to shoot over Purdue. Connects at 39% from three. He's by far their best shooter. You have Zakai Ziegler at 35%. He's their second best shooter. Then you go all the way down to Josiah Jordan James at 33 and a half. And then Vescovy's had a terrible year shooting, 33%. He's also not healthy. Meshack is at 37, but that's on just 38 attempts. He's not an aggressive shooter and he rarely does. So coming off the bench. So, I mean, these guys are going to have to shoot better than their season averages. And Purdue is good on defense. This is not a severe weakness for them anywhere. When you look at the interior, Purdue's one of the better teams at defending that area of the court, which comes as no surprise, just having the elite rim protection of Edie. And then Purdue, I mean, Edie is one of the better players at generating fouls. We saw that early in this game. I think for Tennessee, you probably have to dedicate extra resources to Edie and then hope the number one three-point in the country in Purdue has an off night, which they did in their first game, and it still wasn't enough. The individual shooters for Purdue, I mean, this they're straight flamethrowers. Braden Smith, 44%. Lance Jones is their worst at 36%. Fletcher Lawyers at 45. Off the bench, Miles Colvin's 44. Mason Gillis is 48. Even Cam Heidi's at 46%. That's on 39 attempts. He doesn't play a lot, but it's at least worth noting. Their worst shooters are Lance Jones at 36% and Trey Kaufman Wren at 33. He's only taken 24 attempts. He's not ever shooting. So I mean. It's not just having one player have a bad night either. If Fletcher Lawyer has a bad night from three and Braden Smith is fine, this team still probably wins. There's just so many ways for Purdue to beat you at this point, and they continue to have their opponents take money, which is a surprise for me and one we've continued to bet. So Purdue minus three is where we'll go. This is readily available in the market, and I'll show you some of our tools with Odd Shopper. This phenomenal stuff we have going on, constantly innovating, and surprising me every step of the way, I feel like every time I sign into this, there's new tools. But as you can see, Purdue right now is widely available in the market. And these are kind of just across the board, these minus threes. Points bet, DraftKings, Caesars all have threes. And you're seeing some other three and a halfs across the board. There is one lone three and a half at Bet365 on the Tennessee side with just minus 110 juice if you want to look at that. But again, we're back in the Purdue side. And it also has one of the better edge percentages at 0.3% for a side in total. This is one of the tools that our market-based approach uses to actually quantify what you're looking at with these bets, how profitable they actually are. Sides and totals generally not the most profitable. You see these pop up in the positive with like props and stuff, but it shows you better places to get your money down. And if you actually take one of these Purdue minus threes at 110, it's showing up as one of the better bets. I've seen, honestly, all March Madness. So that's another reason to like Purdue. But aside from this, we have all sorts of odds calculators, arbitrage tools, parlay calculators, and these tools are now available along with our Discord all in one package. I'm in there, Ben's in there. We're talking all these bets, how we're using the tools, and it's interactive if you want to ask questions. These tools have a 5.5% ROI since they've been implemented, and that's over a long sample and a big sample. So check it out. It's $14.95 for a week, $49.95 for a month. No long-term commitments, so even if you just play certain sports or you don't like it, I don't think that'll happen. I love it. Most people do. But if you don't, there's no long-term commitments. The link is below. That'll do it for us. Final four next week and the national championship on the Monday. We'll talk about it. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. That helps a ton. And I'm available on Twitter at Matt underscore Gajeski. If you'd like to reach out, DMs are open. Until next time, we'll see you guys later. Good luck.